Welcome everyone. Thank you all for coming to our presentation. We are Satellite, a GraphQL backend as a service. Satellite makes it easy for front end developers to build applications. In today's presentation, first we'll talk about the architecture of a typical web app. Then we'll move on to the challenges of building a specific type of application and get into what a backend as a service is. From there, we'll move on to the architecture of a single satellite and after talk about how we allow for multiple satellites on a one deployment. Last, we'll walk you through a demo of how to use satellite. Applications can be thought of as having two parts, a front end and a back end. The front end is what the user sees and interacts with. The back end handles the business logic and data to support the front end and all of its functionality. In modern apps, a common practice is to completely separate the front end from the back end. Apps that use this kind of architecture require some way for the front end and the back end to communicate. This communication is done through something called an API. The back end produces the API and the front end consumes it. This kind of architecture allows front end and back end teams to work independently and facilitates development of different front end client apps using the same back end. One recent innovation in API development occurred at Facebook with their Newsfeed API. In 2011, Facebook decided to completely rewrite their native iOS app and immediately hit issues when trying to reuse the existing API for the Newsfeed feature. This was the first time they tried to develop an application like this, where the back end was responsible for just returning data and the front end was responsible for all of the user interactions. And for Facebook's Newsfeed, it isn't as simple as retrieving a story, who wrote it, what it says, the list of comments, and who's liked the post. Each story is interconnected, nested, and recursive. The existing APIs weren't designed to allow developers to expose a rich, newsfeed-like experience on mobile. They didn't have a hierarchical nature or let developers select the exact data that they needed. They were, in fact, designed to return HTML back to a web browser. What this meant was that the client application would need to make several round trips to the API to get the info that it wanted. For example, it might have to first get one story and from that story, figure out what other stories it needed to request to complete the feed and keep on repeating that process over and over until it got all the information that it needed. Not only did this result in a large amount of round trips, but each response would contain a lot of data that wasn't needed. Both of these factors combined resulted in unacceptable network performance for the new app. At this point, it was clear to Facebook that they needed to design a better API for the newsfeed feature to improve the mobile experience. Nick Schrock, one of the co-creators of this new API that we now know of as GraphQL, said that their goal for building this new API was to design what they thought would be the ideal API for front-end developers and then work backwards to develop the underlying technology. The key feature of this new API is that it allows front-end clients to specify exactly the information it needs for given requests, eliminating the issues of overfetching and preventing the need for multiple round trips. This networking performance improvement was critical for mobile apps, which have limited bandwidth and require fast response times. One other key feature of GraphQL that has led to its widespread adoption in a multitude of client-side tools is that a GraphQL API uses a strongly typed system to describe its capabilities. This allows clients to use a process called introspection to see exactly what they're able to do with the API, making GraphQL effectively self-documenting. GraphQL was initially developed by Facebook to solve a very specific problem, rebuilding their newsfeed API. Used as an internal tool by Facebook from 2012 until 2015, it ended up spreading and covering most of their mobile app due to its strengths. An open source version of GraphQL was released in 2015. Soon after it was open sourced, GraphQL began being used by many other companies like Airbnb, Twitter, Netflix, and GitHub, and has continued to grow in adoption ever since. So what exactly is GraphQL? At a very high level, GraphQL is referred to as a query language for APIs. To be just a little more specific, it's actually a specification that describes the type system and query language. 
We'll get into these in more detail soon, but for now, all you need to know is that the specification can be implemented in any programming language. It's not specific to any one particular application or architecture. There are, in fact, server-side implementations of the GraphQL spec in just about any programming language you could want. These server-side software implementations are known as GraphQL servers. When a GraphQL server receives a request, it comes in as a string sent from the client to the server over HTTP. The GraphQL server is responsible for parsing the request into an abstract syntax tree, which you can think of as a heavily nested object that can be traversed programmatically. The GraphQL server walks this tree and figures out how to respond to the request. This is essentially what allows for the overall structure of an API interaction using GraphQL. The data available on the server is described using the type system, which allows clients to ask for exactly the information that they want, which then leads to the client getting exactly that information. Having said all that, you might be interested in building your next app using a GraphQL API. While GraphQL certainly has its place in enabling front-end development, there's a lot to consider when it comes to building the back-end of an application in general and a GraphQL application in particular. First, let's look at the basic setup for a backend. They usually follow something like the three-tier architecture. A web server acts as an entry point to the backend. The web server serves static files to clients who request them and acts as a reverse proxy for requests requiring dynamic data. An app server executes the business logic that powers the application. The application server is where requests for dynamic data end up and it is responsible for processing and fulfilling those requests. Lastly, we have a database for data persistence. This is where the long-lived data of the application resides. Now that we understand what kind of architecture a backend requires, we can start to imagine all the different things that a backend might need to do. There's a wide range of different tasks an application might need its backend to perform, all of which require configuration and programming to enable. For the backend of a GraphQL application, one of the key features is actually producing the GraphQL API. As seen here, both individual developers and large companies like PayPal have acknowledged the complexity in creating a GraphQL API. On the next few slides, Lewis is going to dig into what actually goes into making a GraphQL API. Thanks, Jordan. I'll start my section by talking about a little bit about what goes into making a GraphQL API. Uh, the first thing is that you need a GraphQL server to serve the API. The server is responsible for receiving and responding to GraphQL requests. In a GraphQL server, the functionality is specified or defined by two main components, the schema and the resolvers. Uh, at a high level, the schema defines what the GraphQL server can do and the resolver functions tell the server how to do it. They tell it how to fetch the data from the database. The next slides will talk about how the schema is defined and how the resolvers are written and structured. As I mentioned, the schema declaratively defines the API's functionality or what it can do. The schema is made up of types and each type has one or more fields. The code snippet here shows a simple schema definition. It shows a few of the types that can be defined. The first is a custom object type. An object is a unit of data which the API user can uh, create or access. The second is a query type, and it defines how data of the person type can be accessed. And then the third is a mutation type, and it defines how data of the person type can be created or changed. Here it can all be created. The code here only shows what data types uh, what data types are defined and what the API can do, but it says nothing about how those things are done. That's the job of resolvers on the next slide. While the schema defines what the API can do, resolvers are functions that tell the GraphQL server how to respond to requests. Unlike the schema, which has to strictly follow the API specification, the resolvers are flexible. They can be written however they need to to get the job done. Uh, 
They can also be changed depending on how the underlying database needs to be queried. The only requirement uh, is that the resolvers have to return the data that the schema specifies should be returned. In this code example, the query and mutation resolvers correspond to the query and mutation types that were defined in the schema in the previous slide. The last few slides gave a big picture overview of what goes into making a GraphQL API. But to, fully, uh, to make a fully functioning GraphQL backend, though, there's still a lot that needs to be done meaning that along with the GraphQL server, you need the standard components and configuration that would go into a generic backend. Now, if you're a front-end developer who wants to get a GraphQL-based application up and running quickly, all the things mentioned up until now could be a lot to think about. Ideally, if you're focused on building a front-end app with GraphQL functionality, you probably wouldn't want to worry about things like the backend architecture, the configuration of standard backend features, or low level GraphQL configuration like writing resolver functions. A common way to deal with this complexity on the backend is to use a backend as a service. Being able to treat the backend like a service means you can focus on the front end and not worry too much about the details of how your backend is built. With that said, I'll get into how a backend as a service works and what we found when we looked at existing options. Like we said, a backend as a service provides a layer of abstraction or encapsulation of all the standard backend components, along with some pre-configured essential features like SSL and static front-end hosting. In a backend as a service, all those things are treated like a black box and accessed through an API. So in this solution, you just ask for a backend to be created, and then all the components are set up and configured automatically, then you're provided with an endpoint to access it. The reasons you'd want to use a backend as a service are that it reduces development time and complexity for the front-end developers. And maybe that all sounds great, but like with anything convenient, there tend to be trade-offs. So what this chart shows is when talking about treating computing as a service, uh, an infrastructure as a service like EC2 gives you a high amount of control, but you have to set up everything yourself. Uh, in between is a platform as a service like Heroku, which, is, uh, which just provides the operating system. And then last is a backend as a service, which abstracts away the most, which makes it easy to use, but you're also trading away most of your control. While building satellite, we researched to see what already existed. And as you might imagine, there are many backends as a service already out there. These tend to fall into two categories, the managed services and open source products. Uh, managed services tend to have lots of features and a high amount of support, but they're also proprietary and generally not open source. So they can risk vendor lock-in if your project grow outgrows a backend as a service. They don't always also provide a GraphQL API, or if they do, it can require extra setup. The second category is open source options like Parse and many other lesser known ones. They're not proprietary and some have lots of features, but they tend to be complicated to set up and to use. Like the last slide mentioned, the existing GraphQL backend as a service options have many useful features, but also have their own set of trade-offs. For example, with managed services, you don't have to deploy them yourself and they're easy to use, but they're of course not fully open source. Or with the open source solutions, you retain control of your data, but you have more complicated deployment and setup. You might need to select and configure your own database, for example. They can also take time to learn after you set them up. At this point, we saw an opportunity for an easy to use, self-hosted, open source GraphQL backend as a service. We wanted something that's simple to use like a managed service, but also uh, able to be self-hosted and retain control of your data like one of the open source options. Since Satellite does focus on simplicity of setup and use, what it trades off is not having lots of features. 
Our reasoning was that other features could be integrated later if they are needed. For example, it doesn't use it doesn't include uh, user authentication, but there are lots of there are tools like uh, Auth0 that could be integrated without too much trouble. The relative simplicity of satellite means that it won't be a good option for every application, but it should be a good fit for developers who want to quickly build a GraphQL based application without having to worry too much about the backend. To elaborate on that, we built Satellite for a development team who needs a sandbox environment for front-end developers. In this situation, Satellite could be deployed by a system administrator, then it would provide easy access for one or more front-end developers who can log into Satellite deployment and create and use their own backends, where each backend can host a different front-end application. So that was an overview of what Satellite is and what problems it was meant to address. Uh, so now I'll have a hand, uh, hand it over to Will who will talk about how it works. All right, thanks, Lewis. Uh, yeah, so now that we've established where Satellite fits as a GraphQL backend as a service, we'll talk about what makes up the Satellite core application. So first of all, what is Satellite? Now, the core application of Satellite provides client applications, a GraphQL API for accessing the underlying data store, and static file serving for front-end hosting. These features are made possible using several components under the hood. An Nginx web server is used for serving static files and routing incoming requests. A Node.js express application server provides a way for administrative actions to be made on the Satellite instance, and a DGRAPH graph database is used as the data store. In the rest of this section, I'll explain the decisions that led to this architecture and the components in it and how they work together. So when we first started building Satellite, we were immediately faced with a question. And that was, how do we build a GraphQL backend that works for any application without knowing what kind of data that application will require ahead of time? Essentially, we needed to build a generic GraphQL backend that would work for any application. To answer that question, first we had to understand, what does it even mean to define an application's data? Typically, the backend for a GraphQL application will require some kind of persistent data store. A common database that is good for storing the kind of interrelated data that a GraphQL application will likely use is a relational database. A relational database requires a schema of its own to define how the data, in addition to the GraphQL schema required to define the API. Requiring a database schema in addition to the GraphQL schema would add another piece of configuration that would have to be provided to the backend, which is something we wanted to minimize in order to keep satellite easy to use. To prevent the need for an additional schema definition in order to use satellite, at this point, we thought we could come up with a way to generate a relational database schema from a GraphQL schema. This would eliminate the need for two schemas and make it possible to define the backend's data using only a GraphQL schema. Now we wondered, is it even possible to convert a GraphQL schema to a relational database schema? Well, taking a very simple GraphQL schema as an example, it's pretty easy to see how this would work. For a GraphQL schema with a single object type with just a few fields, we could generate a database schema defining a table corresponding to the object with all of the necessary columns to represent the fields of the object. The logic for this kind of hypothetical conversion process should be a relatively straightforward matter of just converting strings. So for now, we were ready to proceed to the next challenge. Now that we had a way to define the data of an application, we needed a way to access the data. As we've mentioned, making the data available for a GraphQL backend requires a GraphQL server to serve the API, and that GraphQL server needs to contain resolver functions to know how to respond to the requests. The thing is, writing these resolver functions requires the developer to, to go under the hood and edit the backend's code, which is also something we needed to avoid in order to keep satellite easy to use. As a possible solution, we thought we could take a similar approach as we had for converting the GraphQL schema to a database schema. We could try to automatically generate resolver functions for the most common actions you might want to take with your application's data, like creating, reading, updating, or deleting things and automatically initialize a GraphQL server with those generated functions. Once again, would it even be possible to do this? Well, we need four resolvers for each object type in the schema. One for reading the data with a query type, 
and three mutations, uh, one for creating, updating, and deleting. Now this was starting to get significantly more complicated, but still seemed doable since all of the resolvers followed a similar pattern and we should be able to generate the correct function signatures and required database actions to make it work, at least for a very simple schema like this. Our imagined schema converter would no longer just be a matter of converting strings. Now it would need to generate functions as well, but we still felt confident enough to proceed down this path. We can now envision a hypothetical architecture for our GraphQL backend, requiring only the very simple schema uh, that we've been looking so far as an input. The GraphQL schema would be provided to the schema converter, which would generate a database schema and create the database. It would also generate the necessary resolvers to initialize the GraphQL server. The GraphQL server would then produce the GraphQL API that could receive and respond to GraphQL requests from front end applications. So far, we'd only looked at a very simple schema, too simple really to make a very interesting application out of. When we started experimenting with more complicated schema, the difficulty in creating the database schema and resolver functions increased dramatically. For a more complicated example like we see here, we would need to define multiple tables, foreign keys, and constraints in order to make the database work for the data represented by the GraphQL schema, not to mention ensure that our generated resolver functions were sophisticated enough to interact with that database. Although we were confident that it would still be at least theoretically possible to pull this off, we thought that now would be a good time to take a step back and consider alternatives. This led us to other kinds of databases, and ultimately we ended up at graph databases. Now, graph databases are databases specialized to handle highly interconnected data. They do this by treating their data as a graph, which is similar to how GraphQL treats its data. In fact, some graph databases have integrations with GraphQL to generate resolvers from a GraphQL schema, which is exactly what we were looking for. Two graph databases with GraphQL integrations are Neo4j and dgraph. Neo4j is probably the most widely used graph database, but its GraphQL integration involves using an add-on to the database, which is more complicated setup than we were hoping for. dgraph is less well known than Neo4j, but it has a native GraphQL integration, meaning you don't have to install any add-ons and you even get the GraphQL API directly from the database. Because of its native GraphQL support, we ultimately chose dgraph for the database of satellite. We could now simplify our hypothetical architecture. With dgraph accepting a GraphQL schema as an input and generating the GraphQL API, we would no longer need the schema converter to generate a database schema and resolvers or a separate application server to actually serve the API. So we were able to remove those components from the architecture. What we would now have is the entire backend being created based only on the GraphQL schema provided to dgraph. Although the majority of the heavy lifting was done, we had a couple of additional problems to solve before we could get to the final architecture of Satellite's core application. In addition to the GraphQL endpoint, dgraph exposes administrative endpoints for interacting with this GraphQL schema, such as updating the schema and inspecting the currently loaded schema. We knew that the front-end developer would need to access these administrative endpoints as they work with Satellite, but that these endpoints shouldn't be accessible from the public internet. As it was, we had no way of making only the GraphQL endpoint public to the internet while keeping the admin endpoint private. In addition, we currently have no way to upload or serve static files, files that a front-end developer is likely going to need for their web applications. To solve both of these problems, we needed a couple of more components. The two components we needed were an Nginx web server to serve static files and act as a reverse proxy to the GraphQL API endpoint of dgraph and a Node.js application to provide a way for the developer to upload their static files and perform administrative actions to dgraph's admin endpoint. Now, Nginx was an obvious choice for an efficient and battle-tested web server to act as the internet-facing entry point to a satellite backend and Node.js running a simple express application server worked perfectly for providing a private API that the front-end developer could access to upload their static files and work with the GraphQL schema loaded to dgraph. And this brings us to the final architecture for the satellite core application, which we can now see in a little more detail. The Nginx web server acts as a web-facing entry point to the backend, reverse proxying GraphQL requests to dgraph or serving static files. 
The Node.js application provides a private entry point for the developer to perform administrative actions to their backend, like uploading static files or updating the GraphQL schema. Now that we've explained all the necessary components of a single satellite instance, we can discuss how we made deployment easier. As it stands, to get a single satellite instance running, you'd have to manually download and configure each component individually, specific to whatever operating system you're trying to run it on. This would be a very time consuming and generally just difficult process. The problem we now faced was how can we package all of the components of a single satellite application and their dependencies in a way so that it can be deployed easily wherever it's needed. The solution to this problem was containers. Why would you use containers? Well, they provide a way to package an application with its dependencies in an isolated and consistent way. This means that if you start, for example, a Node.js container, that container has all of the requirements to run Node packaged with it, and you no longer have to worry about manually installing it and setting everything up. The isolation of containers means that whatever is going on inside the container doesn't interfere with the host system. So if you run a container with one, it won't interfere with your host installation of Node. Another good thing about containers is that they are lighter weight than some other options like virtual machines. Now, virtual machines actually require running an entire guest operating system, while containers run directly within the host operating system and use less resources. This makes containers faster to deploy, which is a great fit for satellite. And since Docker is the most popular way to package applications using containers, we chose to use Docker containers to package the component of satellite. Packaging satellite using Docker containers greatly simplified the deployment of each individual component. But since each satellite consists of multiple components, it still required manually starting and stopping each container for the application. Our final optimization for running a single satellite instance was to eliminate this need for starting each container individually. Fortunately, Docker provides a tool called Docker Compose, which is designed specifically for defining and running multi-container Docker applications. Compose uses a YAML file to declaratively describe the containers you want to run, which the Docker Compose tool then uses to launch the containers with the required configurations. Our Docker Compose configuration for launching a single containerized satellite instance looks something like what is pictured here. As you can see, the Compose file also allows for specifying various other options that are required for satellite to run, like environment variables and storage volumes used by the containers to store their data. And now I'll turn it over to Ilias to discuss the multi-instance architecture. Thank you, Will. I'll talk about the multi-instance architecture. After deploying a single satellite, we turned our attention to how we could deploy several satellites. Supporting multiple satellites is essential since front-end developers may want to, the ability to develop several applications or several versions of the same application. So the challenge was, how can we transform our current architecture, which supports only one satellite instance into an architecture that supports multiple satellite instances? The type of architecture we chose as a solution is a multi-instance architecture. In this architecture, multiple instances of a software application run on a machine. Each instance shares the machine's hardware and system resources and is self-contained. We wanted self-contained instances since each application will want its own schema and front-end files for hosting. Let's see how we designed our multi-instance architecture. We have several tasks to complete in creating a multi-instance architecture. First, actually being able to spin up and tear down satellites. Second, making sure that containers within a single satellite instance, like the Nginx server, Express API, and DGraph can communicate with one another. Third, routing requests from the internet to the correct satellite. Lastly, we want to make managing individual satellites easy. So we'll need some kind of admin panel where front-end developers can log in and create satellites, update schema, upload files for hosting and introspect schema. The first ch challenge we set to tackle is spinning up and tearing down individual instances of a backend. The naive solution is to just run multiple compose files on a single machine. This allows for multiple instances, but introduces problems of port, name, and network conflicts. However, the larger problem 
it introduces is that at some point the single machine will run out of available resources as more and more satellites are spun up. To solve this problem of resource scarcity, we could scale vertically by upgrading a single server to have more resources or scale horizontally to include more servers which pull the resources together. The problem with vertical scaling is that there is a limit to how many resources one single server can have and the cost in upgrading the server rises exponentially. We chose horizontal scaling because it is more cost efficient and can scale indefinitely. In this architecture, several machines pull resources together and the number of machines scales according to demand. However, there is still a problem, inefficient resource use. In this diagram, we can see that machine two is at its maximum capacity. Machine one, however, has plenty of room to spare. It would be nice if one of the satellites from machine two could be placed into machine one. Even better would be if individual satellite components could be deployed onto whichever machine is least used at the time to maximize resource efficiency. And that's our desired solution. We want to distribute the individual components of a single satellite across machines to maximize resource efficiency. This solution comes with a set of challenges. How do we spread individual components of a satellite across multiple nodes? We can't use a Docker Compose file anymore. We would need to find a way to either randomly or even with spread containers every time a satellite is deployed. This is because Docker Compose file is node scoped and cannot be used to distribute containers across multiple nodes. Further, we would have to write application code to keep track of available nodes and their resource utilization. Another problem is how do satellite components communicate? Since individual components of a satellite can live on separate machines, they need a way to communicate with one another over the network. For that, they need to have a way to somehow dynamically discover one another's IP addresses and ports. Also, how do we know which node to route traffic to? In other words, which node handle traffic for a given instance of the backend? And finally, what happens when a node or container dies? Ideally, we would want the failed container to be restarted automatically, especially since it gets harder to monitor all containers manually when there are potentially dozens of nodes. In case of a node failure, we would also want the containers to be restarted on a different node. Luckily, there is a solution that can solve these problems. And that solution is a container orchestrator. A container orchestrator is a tool that can be used to solve these problems. Container orchestrators are tools that are used to manage, maintain, and scale containerized applications. For satellite, we use Kubernetes as our container orchestrator because it's the industry standard and is supported by all major cloud providers. In Kubernetes, containerized applications live within a cluster which is a group of connected machines, either physical or virtual. The container orchestration tool solves our specific problems. With a single API for managing nodes and the containers running on nodes, we can easily write commands to spin up new containerized apps or tear, tear them down. We can define the exact way that satellite instances should be spun up through declarative app definitions and even define how node or container failure should be handled. Kubernetes also provides simple networking between containers running on the same or separate nodes and networking for requests coming from the internet. Managing satellite creation and deletion is simple with Kubernetes. We define a satellite instance in a manifest file which describes its ports, names, specification details, and more. We supply this manifest file and some environmental variables like name as arguments to the Kubernetes CLI, which in turn makes a request to the Kubernetes API, which creates the given satellite instance. Tearing down is just as easy, since we just make another command to the Kubernetes CLI and supply the name of the satellite instance to delete, and the, the API takes care of the rest. The next challenge is implementing internal networking. We said before that containers make a single instance. Uh, sorry. We said before that containers from a single instance will potentially be spread across multiple nodes. How can they find each other to communicate? 
For instance, how can our Nginx container forward requests to the Express API? In Kubernetes, each container is given an AP address and is reachable by that IP address. As seen here, we can make a request to the specific IP address and get the request where it needs to go. However, this would require hard coding the IP address of the destination container. This becomes a problem when you consider the fact that containers can fail or be updated. When a container fails or is updated, it is respawned up as a new container with a brand new IP address. So the previous hard-coded IP address will no longer work. How can we route requests internally to the correct IP address, given that containers may change IP addresses? The solution is to use Kubernetes services. Services provide a fixed gateway to containers. There are many types of services, but the one we care about in particular is cluster IP. Cluster IP service exposes a container to internal traffic. The service is defined as routing to a specific set of containers like the Express API, for example. The service is given a name so that other containers who want to send requests to the container defined within the service can make requests to that service instead of destination container. The name of the service is resolved by the internal DNS to the IP address of the service. The service then proxies the request to the correct IP address according to its specification. In this example, the Express API has a service called App Server. App Server is defined as routing requests to the Express container. When Nginx needs to make a GraphQL request, instead of needing to look up the IP or hard code the value, it can send requests to the cluster-wide available cluster IP service called App Server. App Server then forwards the request to the correct container, Express API, according to its configuration. Next task is to route re in external requests to the correct satellite. How can, we, how can requests be routed to the correct satellite instance now that satellites are spread across several machines? For this problem, we use traffic. Traffic is an HTTP reverse proxy that can be used to route requests based on user-defined routing rules. In satellite's case, the subdomain is the name of the satellite. We can use the subdomain as a routing rule to send it to the correct satellite running in the satellite system. Then a request enters this, when a request enters the system, traffic is forwarded the request. Then traffic communicates with the cluster IP service of the Nginx container that it needs to send a request to. Then it forwards the request to the satellite instances Nginx container. We can see that flow here more generally. A request enters the cluster and is routed to traffic. Traffic checks out the subdomain and path of the request and then routes the request to the cluster IP service with the name matching the subdomain. The cluster IP service then routes the request to the Nginx container for that satellite instance. And finally, we want to make, uh, to make manage, managing administrative tasks easy using an admin panel. As it is now, a front-end developer would need to issue commands directly to Kubernetes to manage satellites. This is far from ideal, since developers may not know how to use Kubernetes. In addition, he or she would need to have direct access to the Kubernetes cluster, which comes with its own set of challenges and security concerns. Is there some kind of interface we can provide to abstract away the process of managing satellites? We use a GUI as our instant interface of choice for managing individual satellites, namely an admin panel. The admin panel is a React application that communicates with an Express API and is available at admin.yourdomain.com, where your domain is the domain of your choice. Through that React app, front-end developers can create and destroy satellites, configure the GraphQL schema of their application, upload files for static hosting, and manage satellites data. Now we have reached the final multi-instance architecture. We have a Kubernetes cluster, which the containerized satellites run on. Traffic, a reverse proxy running as a container within our cluster, routes external requests to the correct satellite. An admin panel is provided at admin.domain.com, 
and is used by front-end developers to perform administrative actions on satellite instances they own. This is all good, but how about building an actual application? Let's build a to-do app with satellite. Right now, we don't have any satellites running, so let's create one. We'll call it a to-do app. It takes a few moments for the backend to spin up. And once it's ready, we can begin configuring our application. We start by defining the GraphQL schema of the to-do list. The schema is uploaded as a text file. Once the schema is uploaded, admin panel will display the current schema of the satellite instance. Let's seed the database with some data. Here we're performing a GraphQL mutation to add entries to the to-do list. Since we named our app to-do app, the backend will be available at the subdomain to-do app of, the dem of your domain. All we need to do is update the JavaScript files to make requests to the correct origin. Once the front-end files are updated and ready to go, we upload them to be served by Satellite Instances web server, Nginx. And as you can see, we now have a to-do app built and ready for venture capital funding. Some of the features that we intend to implement in the future. We would like to provide an authentication mechanism so that front-end developers don't have to rely on third-party providers. Also, we would like to add a way to keep track of API metrics and logs. And finally, we would, we would want to facilitate the easy database backups and exports. Here are the people involved in bringing this project to life and who presented for you today. Thank you all for coming. And we're gonna open for questions now. Yes, I think just if you have questions, go ahead and type them in the uh, the chat or there's the question and answer in Zoom too. We'll give you give you a few minutes to, to get your questions in. So go ahead and let us know what you wonder, what you're wondering. There we go. We have a question from Edmund. Um, hey guys, amazing work. There's so much happening here. Yes. I had a question about where the backends are hosted. Uh, could you elaborate on this? So I guess I can, I can take this one. Um, yeah, with Kubernetes, so we, we kind of mentioned it really quick. It is supported by you know pretty much every cloud provider, so you can you essentially get a managed cluster as a service, a managed Kubernetes cluster as a service. So you would end up hosting your backends actually on on the cloud provider. Now it's also possible to to run Kubernetes like on on your own hardware, your own kind of bare metal setup. So that's that's kind of an option too. So they're kind of hosted wherever wherever you want. Typically a cloud provider, but if you had the infrastructure, you could you could run them locally as well. Looks like another question um, from Daniel. A couple questions, actually. Uh, where is the Kubernetes cluster hosted? Does a user need to configure it for certain cloud architecture? I, I think I, I think I might have just answered that. So if you want more clarification, Daniel, definitely you can ask a follow-up question. And Daniel's second question: What were some of the challenges of using a graph database versus a uh, like a SQL database? So I guess um, just from my perspective, the, the graph database, so it uses like a completely different kind of query language and, and they're specific to different kind of graph databases. So like dgraph has a different query language than Neo4j. I think they generally, there's, there's kind of some standards that they follow. So there's like, and um, it, it kind of, kind of the general standard is called like Cypher or like open query and things like that. So using a, using a graph database, if you're using it directly, you've got 
like an entirely different query language, basically. Um, you know, and the data model and everything for the graph database is obviously a lot different. But you know, using GraphQL to interact with the database really abstracts all that away. So you're just you're just really using you know the kind of GraphQL queries that a that a front end developer would be familiar with. So that is challenging, but you generally don't have to deal with it um, directly. Got a couple more questions here. A question from Rodney: um, Can you talk more about the process of setting up a reverse proxy? Could you elaborate on that and any challenges you faced during that part or anything you learned in that process? I don't know if anybody from the team might remember when we were setting up our, our kind of reverse proxy from scratch. I guess, I guess one of the things about a reverse proxy, like if you're just using Nginx, um, you know, just kind of like you know, configuring it manually, right? Um, you've got a lot of settings to manage and, you know, you've kind of got to make sure everything is, is exactly right. And, you know, it's just, it's just kind of weird dealing with that kind of low level configuration. And I think that's, it's actually very, very challenging for an application like, like satellite, where we were talking about the multi-instance architecture, where you have you have essentially backends. You've got you know these upstream destinations being created and destroyed dynamically. You kind of think about that. You'd have to go into your configuration and update it manually every time, right? So that would be kind of like not only it'd be challenging to say the least. It'd be impossible, really. So that's that's where um, the service traffic really came in. It it actually dynamically sort of manages all that configuration itself on the fly based on the kind of service discovery that it that it enables when it's when it's working with your kubernetes cluster so I, you know i think those are some of the challenges of reverse proxy and yeah things that we learned as part of that process is that there's some there's some pretty robust tools out there you know it's, it's kind of a, a well-known problem question from emil um, regarding your choice of kubernetes for container orchestration, what made you choose it over Docker Swarm? Maybe if uh, I think I can jump in on yeah, that. Yeah, there you go, Elias. Yeah, um, yeah. It's given that Docker Swarm is is much easier to set up than Kubernetes, like the define the application and so on. But there are two main reasons why we chose Kubernetes over Swarm. First is actually. Uh, for us as, as framework developers, it might be more complicated, but since uh, most managed providers like um, Azure and AWS, DigitalOcean, they all provide managed Kubernetes clusters, which are very, quite easy to use once you have your application packaged. Um, in contrast, uh, with Docker Swarm, you have to provision every node separately. You have to connect them together. And as a system administrator, you have to manage the cluster yourself. So for the end user, using Kubernetes is simpler. And the second reason is, without going into too much detail, um, persistent data in Swarm is more difficult because when, if you have a database running in, the node, in one of the nodes, for example, in a cluster, and let's say that the container died and it was rescheduled on a different node, uh, with Swarm, there is no really, uh, no easy way to move the data together with the container to another node. But um, with Kubernetes, all major providers provide external storage that can be easily configured from the same manifest file. And so if your container that contains data, like a DGRAF, for example, goes to another node, um, the data grows with it. So th these are two main reasons. It's like a couple, um, couple more questions. So if you have any other questions, make sure to get them in. Question from Drew, how did you decide that you wanted to work with GraphQL for your project? Um, I, can, I can address this one. Um, I think we all had our reasons separately, but um, one of my main reasons was that GraphQL solves the problem of overfetching for the client very well and it also prevents round trips. So I thought that it was a neat convergence of um, solving front end problems. And then also a back end as a service kind of solves the problem of developing a back end for front end developers. So 
those two things combined made the front end experience much simpler. So I thought it was a neat kind of combination of benefits there to use GraphQL. Okay, and the, uh, the last question that we have is from Cody. Does, oh, we actually have another question. Okay, so a couple more questions, but does this work with any kind of front end application and what did you use to develop the admin panel? Um, I could answer that. Um, yeah, it'll work with any fr uh, front end application that you just have to tell it to make GraphQL queries to the back end. So as long as it can do that, it'll work. Um, and then the admin panel is just a React app. So we didn't use any special tools to build that. I think we use the front end, wait, we use React for the front end of the admin panel, but there is also an Express app running in the back, back end of the admin panel um, to keep track of data and a Postgres database. So. All right, and a question from Owen. It sounds like you guys were able to save yourselves from reinventing the wheel several times. Yes, with a number of problems you encountered along the way, utilizing existing tools like traffic to keep track of each uh, where each component is located. How do you get from being confronted with a problem to discovering that a tool already exists to solve it? I think from my perspective, it, it's kind of like, I mean, you're encountering this problem and you like bang your head against the wall, um, you know, for hours, maybe days, um, just trying to understand the problem, um, you know, and you, you kind of work it out on your own. And, and it's really only then that you can start to understand why these, why these tools, you know, why they are the way that they are. Because if you're just trying to jump into, say, Kubernetes or say, you know, traffic as an ingress controller, just from like like nothing before you even fully understand the problem. I mean, they're not going to make any sense. You're not going to have any idea like where to even start with them. So I think I think that there's you know a lot of pain um, that, that goes into it. A lot of a lot of kind of struggle and a lot of just self education. But then you start to you start to understand the problem. Um, you start to kind of know what kind of questions you even need to ask. And then you start to like start asking those questions, say to like Google, you know, like how do I do this? And I think that kind of guides you to to the actual existing tools for those kind of problems. Yeah, and, and just to expand on that a little bit or add to it, um, in Will's section where we're where we're going from schema converting eventually all the way to a graph database, um, that was a multi-week process of a ton of research and a lot of patience, and like he said, a lot of headbanging to try and figure out what was the best option for us. So it just takes a lot of time and patience and energy. All right, so it seems like that is all the questions that we have. Um, yeah, I think, thanks for- I think we have another question. Oh, do we? Okay, okay, <laughs> yeah, all right. Question for each of you. Thank you, Rodney. Um, what was the most meaningful part of working on this project for you or the most meaningful part of working on this project? So. Um, I could go first. Uh, I think for me, it was just, um, just uh, uh, coordinating a project that lasted this long because I'd never worked on a group project or team project that was this, uh, this involved. So um, that was, Kind of a learning experience to be able to to do that and um yeah that's about it um i can go next um reverse proxies were somewhat new to me like the whole kind of implementing them was new to me at the start of this and also um Kubernetes, of course, was new to me. So learning more of the networking side of things and how to actually set up a reverse proxy, those really expanded my kind of server side understanding of um, computers and all of that. So I think that that was the most valuable part for me. Yeah, I think a, a very meaningful part for me um, from a technology side was working with the statically type system of GraphQL. I haven't gone through like launch school's curriculum, of course, we're dealing with dynamically typed languages. 
And so it was, it was very interesting to work with a statically typed you know, system. Like, I mean, GraphQL is not a whole programming language, but it does use that strongly typed um, schema. So just, just kind of like doing that. And it's, it feels kind of weird. It's like, why, why do you, why do you do this? It seems like a lot of, it. but then seeing the kind of, you know, applications that you can get as a result of that, the kind of like schema introspection that, that um, enables, that was um, really, really interesting from a technical side for me. Yeah, I'm going to ditto everyone. No, joking. Uh, I think the, the most maybe like what I got most from this project is um, learning uh, how to deal with the uncertainty, especially about the project. Like uh, initially when we were starting out, like, well, there was no way we could like see how it all, how it would all end and like where we would get. And it's like now that we see it coming together, it's very different. And I think that that's pretty much it. Like, um, like it's it, it, it learning how to be okay with not knowing what the next step is gonna be and just diving at, in at the deep end is probably um, was very meaningful to me. Okay, I think, I think that's it. I made sure to scroll down all the way on all the boxes. So yeah, again, thanks for, thanks for coming to our presentation, everyone, and hope you enjoy the, uh, the rest of your start of this new year. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming.